elevate him live. It is good to be with you guys today. Um, I have, I, I want to start with prayer and then I have a couple announcements and then we're going to dive straight in because it's a, it's a full boat tonight. So Father, I just thank you for everyone that's joining us now here on Elevate Live or later, going to listen to this later. I pray that you'd minister to their heart, that you promote your name, that you would encourage and connect them to the truth, love, and the Holy Spirit that comforts and leads us in all truth. And we just thank you, Father, that you're a good Father. Your nature and your character are for us, not against us. In Jesus' name, amen. Boom. So thanks for joining me. I want to tell you, rarely do I just promote something uh, so strong, but I do want to promote something. In the midst of all this virus and stuff, I'm glad it's heating up. If you live in Texas, I know my Florida peeps have, have been in the heat already, but today Texas opened its eyes and, I mean, it was 90 degrees and it felt like 210, and I was melting. Uh, so my bald head couldn't take it. But uh, this virus is starting to burn off, but we've got some exciting news. We, we had to delay our conference in Florida and reschedule that, or we're rethinking that, but we've gone ahead and uh, set the dates for August 7th and 8th, and a church by the name of New River that are friends and partners with us, as well as we're partners with them, is, have decided to host this at their church in Weatherford, Texas, and we're gonna host a fully connected marriage retreat for those of you who joined us last year i think there was 175 couples 350 people and it was over the top it was fun it was great chad and megan did an, such a good job and i felt like our team communicated it wasn't just the stale uh, finances sex and communication it, it, we we brought a fresh bread word and now word and we just ministered. We had fun. It was a really cool time. And I, I know I'm going to get a lot of questions. Are you doing the same exact marriage conference as you did last year? And the answer is no. New material. Uh, we're going to have some new guests, new people. So you won't want to miss it. You can join us or, or uh, register at ElevateHim.com. And it's $175 per couple. Not per person. Per couple. So it's very inexpensive, and some of you need to step forward. If you're out there and you're thinking about getting married, this is a conference. If you're newly married, this is your conference. If you're in a 911 situation, you go, hey, things aren't going good for us. You're going to be encouraged and equipped. If you're in a good marriage, move into a great marriage, no matter what quadrant you're in, this is going to sharpen and help you in your marriage. So it's August 7th and 8th. It's called Fully Connected. You can join us at ElevateHim.com. We'll have one of our team members put that in there and link you so that you can do that. And if you will, tag some other people and invite some other people to this. It makes it a whole lot of fun. So now to my topic. Uh, this is not a, um, a new topic. Uh, I want to take a old question that's been around since the early 1900s as far as I can figure it. And I want to talk about it and kick it around a little bit and then a beat, bring a biblical perspective to it, bring in some different things, and then I'm going to end on a different question for you. So here's the question. It's the proverbial question that's been kicked around. It's been philosophized, scrutinized, spiritualized. Philosophers, psychologists have kicked this around. So here it is. You've seen it before. Here it is. And what I'm holding there, how do you see that or perceive that? Is the glass half full or half empty? And if you haven't seen it before, okay, I just need you to get your perspective. Is that half full or is half, half empty? And so the main purpose, I think, from a psychological viewpoint is they're trying to identify how do you perceive yourself? How do you perceive others? How do you, what is your worldview? Do you kind of look at the, the world as half empty? Uh, needing something, or do you look at it in a very um, positive way, optimistically, and see it half full? And there's not a right answer. You're not on an interview. Uh, my son's graduated college. He's fixing to show up for an interview. I think all of us out there know if you go to an interview and they ask you, do you see a glass half empty or half full, the right answer, the correct answer that they're looking for is this. Yes, it's half full. I love, I'm optimistic, even if I'm dying. That's, that's the right answer that people want to hear. But I, I have a different perspective tonight. Um, pessimistic 
people or critical thinkers can get a wrong uh, or a bad rap versus somebody uh, just optimistic all the time. So let me give you a couple of thoughts that I had this week. If I'm testing the atom bomb, I don't want to be with Tony Robbins, Mr. Positive Cheerleader. I just don't. I just don't. If we're going to test this bomb for the very first time and it has a chance of killing me, all the people we're working with, and it can kill a whole city, I want a critical thinker. I want someone who's going to look at every situation as if we're going to die. I don't know about you, but I... And especially, think about this, that's the atom bomb, especially when it comes to my kids. If you're going to be around my kids, I need you to be thinking negatively for a positive outcome uh, so for their safety. But no one wants to go test something dangerous and be with rah-rah Tony Robinson. I don't. I love Tony Robinson. I'm not ragging on him. But in the same way, I don't want to be with a pessimist or a critical thinker in a foxhole and there's a platoon of 200 and there's only two of us and we got a 10% chance of living. I don't want to be in a foxhole with somebody that's screaming, we're going to die. We were watching a movie the other day, I think it was called Underwater, and it was a kind of scary movie to me. You know, all these things are moving around, they're drilling in the ocean, but there's this one girl in the, in the movie that's just screaming all the time, we're going to die, she's a pessimist. And in that situation right there, I don't want to be around her. I want someone screaming, we're going to live. If you're in the foxhole with me, I want to hear, we're going to make it. God is going to give us a way out of this. We're going to get through it. How about you? So let's look at what scripture, and there's not a right or wrong. I think sometimes we just need to take an honest look at ourselves and see, do you have a perspective in life in at least some portion? You might not have a bad perspective or a pessimist. Uh, perspective when it comes to yourself, but you might have one towards your spouse or you might have one towards the church. I know there was a time in my life that I was a pessimist when it came to the church. I went through about a year and a half that I was just like, dude, it's going down. It's all bad. It's doom and gloom. I was Eeyore. Here's the deal. I, it was just a season that I walked through, but let's take an honest look in your marriage, in your personal life, at your workplace, in the church. How do you fit because the the real answer in that I think we're both optimistic and pessimist I think sometimes when it comes to me I am a prophet of hope when it comes to people I met with a dude today I just I love this kid that's all I'm going to tell you I just loved being with him I loved him and I loved how real and raw he was and but my, my hoper just comes out and I'm going to do that the night before I was with a couple and we were doing marriage camp counseling. My hoper just comes out. I don't give up on people. I may bark. I may bite. I may do a lot of things, but I'm not going to give up on you. So, but here's the thing. I can be Mr. Hope for other people. Sometimes I can be a pessimist against myself and be really hard on myself and pick out the negative. How about you? So let's look at two characters in the Bible. I love what Paul, kind of a heavyweight, uh, in the New Testament, writes two-thirds of the New Testament, and this is Paul's writing in 2 Corinthians 12.10. Here's what he writes. For the sake of Christ, I'm content with weakness, with insult, hardship, persecution, and calamities. For when I'm weak, I am strong. This is a very, very optimistic thinker here. He's like, listen, no matter what, if it's a personal weakness that comes out in me, it's okay. God's got me covered. If it's insults for me standing up for Christ, I'm going to count it as, as glory to the Lord. Hardships, persecutions, calamities. I want to talk about this for a moment. There is a mindset out there, and we all have it to some point. You're rolling down the road, you're driving, you've got to be somewhere on time, and you get a flat tire. You know what most people's thinking is? God's probably getting me back for something bad. God ain't getting you back. It was just a nail in the road. But sometimes we get so pessimistic that God's coming to get me and I did something bad. Dude, it's just a nail in the road. So hey, hey, this is where I want to look half, half full in my life. When the nail comes to the road, I'm not, I don't want to turn it on me. Paul learned, hey, I'm not going to turn anything on me. I'm going to count it all, even if it's my weakness. I'm going to count it me being strong in Christ because the scripture says this, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So the, the, there is a optimistic viewpoint. One of my favorite characters in the Bible is Elijah. I relate to Elijah. I love Elijah. He's one of the mentors in my life. I know he's dead and he's old, 
but he has mentored me through the pages of the Bible. And in 1 Kings 19.10, remember what Leslie said last week. She said, we hadn't been called to read the Word. We've been called to study the Word, and we need to study it. So here's 1 Kings. Let me set this up for you a little bit. 1 Kings, this is a stud prophet. Uh, he goes to head to head, calls a challenge on a mountain, and tells Baal's prophets, really the devil's priest, meet me up on the hill, it's showdown. It's wide earth, man. We're, we're going to meet up on the mountain, and whoever can call fire down from heaven is the God. If your God can do it, I'll bow down to him. If my God can do it, you bow down to him. So, I mean, he starts taunting them and telling him what's wrong is your God asleep. He's throwing water on the fire. He's just, he's taking the situation and taunting Baal's prophets. In the end, here's what happens. He lets them go through all their things. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all this stuff. And you're going to read this. I want you to go read it in 1 Kings 19, 1 Kings 19 in the morning and read this story. They get finished and he said, well, I guess y'all are tired. And he's like, Father God, do your thing. <laughs> Fire drops on the mountain. God shows himself. I don't know about you. I ain't never called fire from, from the sky. I mean, I think I would kind of believe, and I don't think I'd be afraid of, of anything in life. If I got to call fire down just one time, and I don't want to call fire down on, on somebody, uh, but I, it, that would be cool. Your faith would be at max high, right? Well, it's almost like we turn the page in our thinking and our Western mindset. We turn the page and, and you get, and I mean, just, just a few sentences later, the king that he killed all of his prophets tells his wife, and her name's Jezebel. Um, some of you might know that name, and that name gets slung around a lot, but Jezebel starts taunting and telling Elijah, I'm going to kill you, and she sends word to him. And for some reason... This prophet, this man of God who called fire down from heaven and God answered his prayer, here's what she says in the Bible, in the English version, says this, that he became afraid and he ran. And he ran. I don't know why. There, there's a lot of commentaries out there. I, I don't care, and that's not the point of the story. Um, but I want to show you he ends up in this cave, and he's, he's sitting in there, and he is doom and gloom, man. He's down. And God says, him, here's how the word says it. It says, and the word of the Lord came to him and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? And here's how he replies. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. It's like, dude, you're talking to God. You ain't got to talk to him in a different person. He's right here. He's, but he's telling God, I've been really zealous for you. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altar, and put your prophets to death with a sword. And I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me. You need to go to your Bible and underline right there, I'm the only one left. Uh, God doesn't even answer him right then. He just whispers to him and loves on him. And a few sentences later, God has to come back to him because he repeats it and says, I'm the only one left. And God has to tell him and shine some light. Hey, pessimist, hey, half glass, I need to convert you over to a full glass. You're not the only one left. As a matter of fact, there's 7,000 prophets that... It, that have been hidden that love that have been hidden in Israel. And you're not the only one left. I love the two stories. Paul learned how to be content. Elijah's just being him in this moment. It doesn't mean that Elijah was a pessimist or a critical thinker all the time. It just means in this moment in his life he was a critical thinker. So I, I, I want to read some pretty stunning stuff. Uh, I really like this. Here's what the psychology and the science community believe about people's thinking and viewpoint really as it relates to happiness, joy, or perspective. Here's what they write. You're made up of three different categories according to them. And it says this, 50% of your makeup is genetically hardwired. That means your mom and dad have 50% to do with your DNA makeup. But we have to remember this. Uh, because some of us, listen, if you would have told me that in my 20s and 30s, I, I, I had such a deep father wound that I rejected everything about my dad. At 52, I'm telling you, there's a lot about my dad that I love, though he's gone on to be with the Lord uh, and gave his life to, to the Lord on his deathbed. Here's, he was tested out 165. He was a philosopher. He was 
intellectual. He was really deep. He had high IQ. I had EQ. It felt like oil and water growing up. But I realize now that if God wouldn't have placed me with my mom and dad, I couldn't be doing what I'm doing today without them. And that's the reality. That's the sovereignty of God. So 50% of why God placed me at that moment in time with Linda and Joe Owings is because he had a plan and a purpose that was good for me. And many times when there's trauma or things or hurt or pain or perspective, we can reject it all, throw out the baby with the bathwater, and I don't want to do that. I celebrate my dad. Some of you fully alivers out there need to throw up a prayer to God and say, thank you for making Joe and Linda Owings. Thank you for letting Mark come out of that. Because it was out of that situation, my mom taught me how to love, my dad taught me how to think, and I didn't even know it at the time. But 50% of who you are is genetically hardwired, according to psychologists, according to the science community. Listen to this, only 10% of your perspective has to do with uh, circumstances. So 10% of your perspective, so let, so let me just tell you this right now, if you're struggling in an area or going through a conflict, or in a hard place, or in a financial place, or in a marriage place that's tough and rough right now, perspective only accounts for 10, I mean, your perspective in those circumstances only accounts for 10% of who you are in your entirety. So here's the third thing. 40% of it is your mindset. So 50% is hardwired, 10% is your circumstances, and 40% of it is your mindset. What, is, what does mindset mean? It's a belief system. When you have a bad belief system, it creates bad behavior. When you've got a good belief system, it creates good behavior. That's why the first book I ever wanted to write was to hell with accountability, it doesn't work. I can't police your morality and I can't stay on you as accountability partner and pack at you and bring fear into your life that brings you into a place that you wanna do that. The Bible says wisdom, that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it's not the fear of I'm scared, it's knowing how great and awe and how fearfully and wonderfully you're made. I love this part about mindset. For some of us, we've got to learn and we're both sides of this. No one's 100%, I don't wanna be married to Tony Robbins. I don't wanna be married to Mr. Cheerleader all the time or Miss Cheerleader all the time. Here's the negative sign. Sometimes cheerleading or positive people are naive and don't see the other side. Here's the other flip side of that. Sometimes the pessimistic is so pessimistic, he can't see the positive side of the cheerleading or the celebrating. And I want to put people in my life that I cross pollinate with that teach me. I've got a little girl at work. I call her a little girl, Megan. She's a grown woman. Um, but she is a cheerleader. She is positive, her and Chad both. They don't look back, they look forward. It's part of who they are, and I love them. So just know this in this process. Think about this, 50% DNA, only 10% is your circumstance, and 40% is your belief system or your mindset, and some, we've gotta change a mindset. So I wanna, I'm, I have so much, here today and I'm just bummed because I don't feel like I could get to it all but I, I have a really weird question to ask you if you had a superpower and today you have to answer this what is the superpower that God gave you what is the superpower that God gave you and so here's what I mean by it I'm gonna take my family and and our family lives out loud and wild and we we, we love people we're all about being raw unreligious and just loving people. I love my son Tucker because he's got two superpowers to me. The kid knows determination. I'll put him head to head with any man he's gonna outwork him. Or he is really going to get sick trying. He is so determined, he's determined in school, he's determined in whatever he does. He dealt with dyslexia, dysgraphia, he didn't let it keep it down. He's got determination and humility is a superpower. Ellie Grace, I'm telling you, my daughter was gifted from God with superpowers called joy and focus. And since we brought her home from China, big smile on her face. When we wake her up in the morning, big smile on her face. When we put her down, she's 18, about to leave for school. She wakes up with a smile and she goes to bed with a smile. You watch her in studying, or watch her loving, reading the word or ministering to someone, she's laser focused. It is her superpower. Leslie's superpower is peace and consistency. I would put my wife up against anyone. 
uh, Jesus' mom. I, I just go, my wife is one of the most peaceful. She's got boundaries. I know people want to talk through. Leslie doesn't want to talk through anything until she's processed it in her mind all the way through because she wants to be accurate. She And she got this from her mom. 50% of this came from her mom and dad. So, Tammy, if you're listening, thank you for what you gave. Ralph, thank you for what you gave. But here's the deal. My wife is peaceful and she's consistent. If people work with her or around her, she is the most consistent person I know. My superpower is I believe I'm, I'm hope. I just, I believe in people. I don't want to give up on people. I've got compassion. Uh, I'm both uh, full of hope and passion and compassion. Those are my superpowers. What's your superpower? And you go, okay, Mark, how does this relate back to the glass? Okay, I want to relate it in this way. I think we've been asking the wrong question about this glass. Number one, I don't care how much water's in here. I don't care if you're half full or half empty. Here's the deal. We've got to fill it up. Number two, whose glass is this? That's what we should be asking. No one asked that question. I don't care if you're half full or half empty. Bottom line is, I want to fill it up. I want to know what the content is. I want to know if this is my glass. And if this is my heart and represents my heart, it's, I'm going to take ownership of it. What do we need in our cups right now? Because sometimes it's found in the superpower that God's given you. And sometimes we're not using that and we're thinking in a negative way. And God hardwired you from the factory to bring a superpower, a super love that only you can do in the way that you do it. Megan's is cheerly. Amy has got just, she's got loyalty and deep thinking in the scripture. And I love that. Everyone I work with and around have this superpower. What's yours? And I want you to ask this. What do you need in your glass right now? We've gone through the, what's your perspective? But I also want to move. What do you need in your glass right now? Because last time I checked, you have not because you asked not. So, Father God, I pray for every person right now. I pray that they learn something about their perspective. They don't have to get the right answer. That, that The truth is that there's times that we're pessimists. Elijah was not always a pessimist. But in that one moment, you turned him with a word and turned him and gave him hope by telling him that there's 7,000 just like you that are committed. Father, I pray that you would encourage people no matter what season, stage, age, crisis, Whatever they're in right now, I pray that they be encouraged because God cares for you. He wants to change your perspective. He wants to fill your glass. And let's go ahead and ask, what's our need? Let's go ahead and discover what is the gift that God gave me. And let's find that. Because as Mark Twain said, hey, there's two important uh, times in a person's life. The time that he's born and the, dis and the time that he discovers why. What's your purpose? And you're going to find it in your perspective and your superpower and unleashing that on other people. God bless you. If you want to connect with us, connect with us at elevatehim.com. Send your uh, prayer info to info at elevatehim.com. Join us next Tuesday at 730 and do me a favor, forward this to someone. Share this with someone that you might know that want to hear this. We need people to help us go ahead and grow our influence so that we can promote, encourage, and connect people to the love, grace, and truth of Christ. God bless you and join us next Tuesday. Love you.